and all-time classic for movie buffs, The Great Escape is the true story of a group of Allied prisoners of war who managed to escape from an allegedly impenetrable Nazi prison camp during the Second World War. But beyond the fame of those memorable roles played by Hollywood stars, there were many others, some 10,000 Canadian servicemen, merchant mariners and civilians who also risked their lives and might be all but forgotten if it weren't for the work of military historian Nathan M. Greenfield. Greenfield's research shines the spotlight on these lesser known men and their valuable contributions. Among them, 17 French Canadian priests and brothers captured at sea, who in their own way would harass and confound the enemy as they helped prisoners escape from POW camp Stalag Luft III. Hello and welcome to Catholic Focus. I'm Sheridan Sanders. I'm pleased to welcome to our Salt and Light Studios military historian Nathan M. Greenfield to share the highlights from his latest book, The Forgotten Canadian POWs, Escapers and Evaders in Europe from 1939 to 1945. Thanks for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me. So what's the premise of this book? Well, it's sort of a valedictory book for the men who uh, fought the war, fought in the war, and ended up in the war, as we'll discuss in a few moments, uh, and have not been written about, and their experiences of being POWs have not been written about. Prisoners of war tend to be forgotten, which is the reason for the title of the book, because they are off the chessboard of history, as it were, but I wanted to show that though they may have been quote unquote off the chessboard of history, they were still very much active men in the war. There were 17 religious that were part of the POW camp, Stalag Luft III. Tell me about their story and how that came to be a part of your book. Okay, in a very strange way, um, about three years ago I received the 25th or so uh, uh, memoir of a guy shot down from the RCAF. And I thought, oh, I really don't want to read this, but I paid for it from the UK, so I did. And he refers to Christmas 42, which uh, the services were conducted by Father Philippe Goudreau, Canadian Padre. And I said, he's wrong. There's only one Canadian Padre court in Europe, and it was Father Foote, and he was caught at Dieppe, and he was a Methodist. 25 pages later, we get to Christmas 43, and he talks about him being at, educated at St. Paul's the next in Ottawa. I live in Ottawa. The next day, I call the archives, and I ask to speak to the archivist, uh, who turns out to be an 80-year-old priest named Father Andre, of course. Uh, and uh, I said to him in French, have you ever heard this story about these Canadian priests? And he said to me, sir, what would you like to know? Uh, I've served in Africa for 30 years you know, with Father Goudreau as a missionary after the war, and I have 500 letters that have not been used since the 1950s, uh, which tell their story. So I went to the archives the next day and started reading. So what were the circumstances that led to the you know, 17 religious priests and brothers being part of this camp? Okay, what happened was they were being sent to South Africa as missionaries aboard the SS Zamzam, along with 150 American Protestants and their families who were going to be replacing German Protestants who had been interned by the British because of the war. Uh, in April of 41, uh, the commerce raider Tomasus overhauled the ship and sank it. Uh, the following day after that, they were transferred to the German ship, the Dresden, and then landed in France in June of 1941. The Americans were repatriated because the U.S. wasn't yet at war. The Canadian priests and brothers should have been repatriated or at least interned in a civilian camp. But because the Germans were in violation of Article 16 of the Geneva Convention, which said that you know, there had to be priests uh, to perform services uh, for men of various denominations, the Germans said, well, we have these 16 priests and brothers. We're going to send them into the camps because we don't trust our own priests. Wow. So what were their responses to this initially, and, and what did Canada think about this? Well, the Canadian government tried to get them out unsuccessfully. Uh, the priests and brothers were interesting. Um, for the first 18 months or so, the letters really show that they feel they'd been hard done by. They hadn't signed up for this. Uh, they wanted to be in Basuto land, today's Lesotho. Uh, they write about famine in Africa. They uh, pray for the Basutos, as they refer to them. By about uh, 18 months after being in the POW camps, uh, they were prisoners of war, and 
although they never became padres officially, and they tried to get themselves brevetted, which means appointed from a civilian position, into the RN, they were acting as padres and in some camps being treated as padres. Give us a sense of who else was in the camp and what everyday life was like there. Camps differed greatly. Uh, most of the priests spent most of the war up in the, a camp uh, in northern Germany called Malag Milag Nord with uh, uh, prisoners from naval ships uh, that were captured and also other civilians. Uh, the um, others, like Father Goudreau, were sent to Stalag Luft III. So their lives varied uh, uh, to some degree where they were and when they were. All of them went through terrible bombings. Uh, Father Junot, uh, literally his life was saved in, uh, in Wolfsburg, Austria, because he was late coming back from lunch to his, uh, his barrack, and a bomb dropped and destroyed it and killed the Anglican uh, priest that he was sharing his room with. Wow. What was it like in terms of the types of possessions that they had? What were their daily activities like? Some of them, uh, when they left the Zam Zam, were able to take their luggage, the one piece of luggage. Others, just the clothes uh, on their back, and one literally ran back to his uh, uh, room for his crucifix that he'd forgotten when he left when the alarm went up. They were the only men in the camps with civilian clothes, uh, which is why Father Goudreau was often asked for his clothes for the uh, theater, because he had real civilian clothes. It also explains why he was offered the opportunity to escape in the Great Escape, because he was going to pass himself off as a civilian. Uh, the other reason was that he'd been in the camp, one of the longest in the camp, in Stalag Luft III. Um, their daily lives were varied. Uh, generally, they were, they were not forced to work as some men were. Uh, they ministered, they spoke to men, they interceded with German authorities. Uh, they wrote letters, uh, sometimes very long letters. They were allowed longer letters than regular uh, POWs. What sort of precautions were taken so that people didn't escape? And, and how did these priests sort of play around with those rules? Well, of course, there were the guard towers and the dogs. Uh, and the Germans did uh, place in several camps the barracks up on um, cinder blocks so they could see if there were tunnels being dug. Uh, at Stalag Luft III, they got around that by tunneling through the bricks that were underneath the oven in the, ca in the bar barracks, which kept things warm, a la, a la what you see in Hogan's Heroes. Uh, and uh, so that was one thing. Uh, Father Goudreau uh, was very much aware of the rules and broke them often. Uh, when he was transferred from uh, one camp to another on his way to Stalag, Luft three, he was sm smuggling letters uh, from uh, the officers at Milag Malag Nord. Had he been caught, he would have been executed. Father Charbonneau, who was at um, the camp in Poznan, Poland, uh, met with Oblate secretly outside the camp with the connivance of the commandant. But in order to throw the Gestapo off the scent of such activities, uh, Charbonneau, who was a young priest, only 27, would write these long woe is me letters, which he'd be complaining about being stuck around all these men who would, you know, didn't take showers often enough. All they wanted to talk about was wine, women, and song, and those are not the way he put it. Uh, but uh, they were all, all those letters were designed to make the Gestapo think that this young priest was miserable when, in fact, he was meeting outside the camp and corresponding with Oblates, something which would have cost him his life. I'm also interested in how did they respond to different faiths and, um, in, in some cases, different types of Christians? The, all the priests and brothers came from small-town Quebec, which means that they would have had almost no contact with Protestants, Anglicans, and, of course, Jews uh, prior to this experience in the camp. Uh, the letters are interesting about that. Some of the fathers simply record the fact that they suddenly are dealing with these men from different faiths. Uh, uh, in one case, Father Juno, again, the one who is in Austria, uh, he begins questioning uh, his Catholic faith. He remains a Catholic. He remains in the church. But there are some fascinating letters in which he asks about whether transubstantiation is real or whether it is symbolic, as the Lutherans would believe, for example, and con uh, the con con transubstantiation. And so he's asking these questions because he's talking with men of different faiths. And he's, he's quite honest about this. He also starts conducting his uh, services facing the congregation in 1944, uh, which is 20 years before Vatican II. Right. How did the priests and brothers assist those inside of the camp? In different ways. Uh, Father Charbonneau conducted 18 conversions in the camps, and I have the records of those conversions. Uh, Father Goudreau, for example, conducted none. Uh, he said that it was an unnatural uh, 
situation and that a rational decision could not be made under the circumstances of being in the camps. He allowed the men to come to mass, but he would not give them uh, uh, the host, for example. Uh, either way, you can make an argument for it. I've spoken to canon lawyers, uh, various canon lawyers, and they've each said that each argument is perfectly acceptable from a canon law point of view, and each, uh, each father actually writes about the other's decision and supports it. Um, on a daily basis, they um, spoke to the men. In many cases, they dealt with Dear John letters, uh, men who were undergoing stress because of uh, wives or girlfriends who had uh, broken up with them or had gone astray. Um, they conducted mass. Uh, I have the chalice that was made in the camp for Father Bergeron and the pipette that was used for the four drops of wine because they had so little wine. Um, the Germans, for the most part, allowed the conducting of services without any, uh, without interfering, because that was the purpose of having the men. The Germans saw the fathers in the camps as a way of keeping the men basically happy, quiescent, and uh, keeping the Red Cross happy, for, uh, because the Red Cross did inspect prison of war camps. Must remember, we're talking about prison of war camps, not concentration camps. Uh, and they, of course, the Red Cross uh, inspected those in Canada. So records were going back and forth between Germany and Canada about life in the POW camps. Let's go back to the Great Escape again. What were the circumstances that uh, sort of prompted this? And also, what specifically was the role of the, the priests? Well, Stalag Luft III was an Air Force camp, and so these all, were all officers. And they believed, as did all the men, that their duty was to at least make life miserable for the Nazis, if not escape. The more d life you made miserable in the camp, the more guards they had to be, the more resources were being spent in the camp and not on the battlefield. Uh, the, there was a Canadian at Stalag Luft III, uh, Wallace Flutie, from up north of Ontario, and he designed the tunnels, the most famous tunnels, Tom, Dick, and Harry. Harry was the only one that was used. Uh, so Father Goudreau was there at that point. He blessed the tunnel. Uh, he was offered the chance to escape, as I said. He also sends a letter home indicating the tunnel is being built. Well, I should say perhaps the tunnel is being dug. Uh, the letter is a letter that is in flowing 19th century theological French. Um, essentially, it's theological boilerplate, it, and in the middle of it, there, sticking up like a sore thumb is a sentence which says, we must cultivate our God-given gifts in the garden that we have, which doesn't fit the rest of the letter. It also echoes quite clearly the last line of Voltaire's Candide, which is, we must cultivate our garden. Voltaire, the arch-atheist of pre-revolutionary France. I showed this letter to several men who knew Father Goudreau, and they said, yes, this would have stood up like a sore thumb. It would have made his, uh, the uh, Father General of the Oblates take notice of it. And there was a code that was used by POWs called the Norway Code, which is the 10th sentence of my letter pairs with a third sentence of his letter, etc., to give a message. This clearly would have belonged to that sort of a sequence and brought attention to his garden at precisely the point when I know from other information that gardens like his were being used to hide the spoil, which was yellow ground, yellow dirt, under from the tunnels that were being dug for the Great Escape. He also spends the years after the Great Escape in prayer because he was would have been the 50th man out, and the 50th man out was executed in the executions after the Great, es great Escape. Mm -hmm. How did men experience Christianity in the camp? In a strange way, actually. Um, the liturgical calendar becomes extremely important, more important than I think it would have been in regular life had they remained as uh, you know loggers or as doctors or as miners up in northern Ontario. Um, Lent, of course, is uh, 40 days, but the run-up to Easter, whenever it falls in the calendar, was extremely important. It gave the men something to do. Uh, the run-up to Christmas was extremely important for the same reason. They would save their chocolates so they could dip uh, peanuts in chocolate. They would save the silver from their uh, cigarette packages so they could make little uh, balls to put on, on, in the um, barracks. The other thing that was extremely important was they could be absolutely certain, and it was really the only times they could be, let us say, when they went to Mass at Easter or Mass at Christmas, that m their mother, their father, their girlfriend, their sister, their brother, their grandparents, in six or seven hours, or eight hours or nine hours, depending upon where you were in the country, Canada that is, would be doing precisely the same thing 
at precisely the church they had always gone to at, after having the Christmas donuts or whatever their tradition was, which is not something they could be sure of on every single Sunday. So it plays a major role in their letters. They write about liturgical events uh, much more than you would have done so if I was simply looking at letters written by, let's say, two brothers, one living in Vancouver, one living in Toronto. Mm -hmm. There are many stories of courage and hope. Can you share one of those with us? I think that the one that comes to mind when you say that most strongly actually isn't one of the fathers. It's uh, Ian McDonald, who was shot down on his second bombing run in 1943, and he's on, uh, he is in Aveda for six weeks before he's betrayed into the arms of the Gestapo. Towards the end of the war, he breaks away from what were called the hunger marches, and uh, he and his uh, one of his crewmates are running across a field of heather towards some trees where they're going to spend the night and they get into the trees and then some American marauder bombers come over and they're hitting German positions nearby and the rockets light the field of heather aflame and so he said to me we saw this field of fire coming at us mile an hour and we were about a quarter mile away we couldn't run fast enough from it so we left the field of heather we dug up the heather around the copse of trees and as the flames came around the copse uh, he recited the Lord's Prayer as he was almost choking to death, and the fire went around the uh, heather, and he could hear the crackling going behind him, finally, and he knew he'd survived. And it stands as an example of how uh, the faith of men uh, 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 sustained them in the worst of times, and how men look to their faith, a faith that was very personal in some ways. Then they weren't concerned about whether or not I was a Catholic or you were a Protestant or, in fact, if you were a Jew. It was the, uh, the faith they had in each other and the faith they had together in God. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your experience writing this book and what's come out of it for you? Humbling. Uh, as I was when writing uh, the book uh, before this was about the Canadians who fought at Hong Kong and the prisoners of war, getting to know these men in the twilight of their lives, spending hundreds of hours on the telephone with them, uh, getting to be close friends with them. Uh, Ian McDonald last April called me uh, on a Sunday night, which is quite out of the ordinary, and uh, I said, what's up? And he said, I have an anniversary tonight. And I said, oh, Ian, it didn't click. It was the night he was shot down. And he said to me, it's been my habit to call a member of my um, crew every year since 1946, but they're all gone, and you're the only one who knows what happened to us. And in fact, you know more what happened to us than we did, and so I thought I should call you. And I was very touched, and I stayed on the phone with him for about an hour looking at my atlas and tracing where he was until he was shot down over France. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much for having me. I was speaking with Nathan N. Greenfield, a military historian and the finalist for the Governor General Award. His latest book is The Forgotten, Canadian POWs, Escapers and Evaders in Europe from 1939 to 1945, published by HarperCollins, a must read for anyone who's interested in the full story of Canada's Second World War experience. For more information or to buy the book, visit harpercollins.ca and follow Nathan on Twitter at Nathan Greenfield. Footage of The Great Escape is courtesy of United Artists and archival images were supplied by Archives de Châtelet at St. Paul University. And that's all for tonight. If you have any comments or questions on this episode of Catholic Focus, write to us, focus at saltandlighttv.org. That's all for tonight. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.